Uh, and also, I want to say a word of thanks, too, to the church. Of course, this is uh, Cynthia and my last Sunday. We've uh, been here since last November, and uh, uh, we want to tell you it's been a tremendous blessing to us. You've been a great encouragement to us and a real inspiration to us, and uh, we're uh, not looking forward, really, to moving on, but we're excited about the new pastor, excited about what the Lord has in mind for you, know it's going to be great, and uh, we're just uh, one, looking forward to what we're going to hear, great things in the future. But we want to thank you so much for being such a blessing to you. You've spoiled us over and over again, and uh, we're enormously thankful for all uh, the blessing that you brought to us. I want to speak this morning on a matter, I'm going to step away from the book of Philippians this morning, but I want to speak to you on a matter that's a tremendous burden to me, and I think for many uh, pastors it is as well. I want to talk to you on the subject of meeting the master. Uh, Cynthia and I have had the privilege uh, on many occasions of, uh, of traveling to other churches and sharing with other churches, or maybe going to conventions or conferences, uh, being on mission trips, and one of the things that is a tremendous burden to me is that there are many people who speak about being Christians, but I don't think they've ever met the master. I, I think that's true in many, many churches, not just here in America, but all around the world. And I think the great demise that we're seeing in America today and the change in morals and ethics and standards and the no God God that we have now in America kicking them out of our schools and everywhere else uh, is because there, the churches uh, there are many people in our churches that think have never met the master I mean they, they, they claim to be Christians and they say they're Christians but by the very lifestyle and, uh, and by the ethics by which they live I think that's a great question I know we have leaders in our government at the moment that uh, are very religious. They quite often speak about the fact of how religious they are in the churches that they attend. And uh, they are absolutely confident they're going to go to heaven because they go regularly to confession and speak to the priest. And when they speak to a priest, of course, he's God's leader on earth and he can release their sin and they're going to go to heaven. That's religion. Religion has never got anybody into heaven. In fact, it was religious leaders that put Christ on the cross. And, and I get afraid sometimes, even for Southern Baptists, because we say we are and we are the most conservative of all denominations, Southern Baptists. So if anybody's going to make it into heaven, uh, surely I will because I'm a Southern Baptist. You know, I, I've listened to the preacher. Uh, my parents are Christians. Uh, I mean, I've sung in the choir. I've been, been a deacon. I uh, attend church, Sunday school, all these kind of things. That, that, that's religion. And religion is not going to save you. It's not going to get you into heaven. You've got to meet the master. And so I want to talk this morning about the importance of being sure that you have met the master. I want to speak about this topic from John's Gospel, chapter 4. In John's Gospel, chapter 3, we, we meet a man there called Nicodemus, a brilliant man. He was a rabbi. He was part of the, the Sanhedrin, greatly respected man. He'd heard Jesus preaching... And he went to Jesus by night and began to talk with Jesus. And having talked with Jesus, he realized, though he had all the training and he'd been through seminary and he was a brilliant man, well accepted among the religious, he realized he'd never met the master. And that night he received Jesus as his personal savior. In John chapter 4, the chapter we're going to look at right now, it's a story of a woman she wasn't like Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a, a seeker of the truth. We're looking at a woman who was not seeking for the truth. She was a woman of the night. She was a prostitute. And, and she wasn't particularly interested in uh, changing a lifestyle. But she was confident, as we see in this chapter here, she was going to heaven because she was religious. And this woman happened to meet Jesus by the well of Sychar. And she realized that she never met the master. <laughs> but on that day in the life of this lady, she did meet the master and her name was written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. 
The two interesting things that you find in John chapter 3 and John chapter 4 is that there were two people who needed one thing to be saved. They needed to meet the Master. And so I want to talk about that this morning. And there are four things that I want to highlight in, in this chapter that I think people can miss and hopefully we, we will be able to catch them this morning. So I'm just going to read through to verse 42. And you've seen how I do it. I just make comments on these verses as we read. So beginning in chapter 4 of John's Gospel, beginning in verse 1, we read this. When therefore the Lord, this is Jesus, when Jesus knew that the Pharisees had heard that he was making and baptizing more disciples than John the Baptist, although Jesus himself wasn't baptizing, but his disciples were. He left Judea and he departed again to go to Galilee. Now, you know, John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. John the Baptist came and he had one message. He told the people, you need to repent. You need to confess your sin. You need to turn away from your sin and you need to turn to God. And if you don't, you're not going to make it to heaven. Now, he couldn't offer them salvation because Christ hadn't gone to the cross, but he could offer them not religion, but a relationship with the Heavenly Father. And as you know, John the Baptist, he was a very direct fellow. And at that time, here at Antipas, was the, he was the ruler under the Romans of the area of, of Galilee. And he had uh, begun an affair with his brother Philip's wife, and so he left his own wife and married Herodias. And John the Baptist came to him and he said, I want to tell you, I don't care who you are, how great a leader you are, how many people appreciate you, and even the Romans stand behind you, you are going to hell. He said it right to uh, Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas had him arrested immediately and beheaded. Now John the Baptist was the Bible says that he was a forerunner. He was the announcer of the coming of Jesus. And he was baptizing people out of the River Jordan. And at first just a few people came, then hundreds, then thousands came. And the Pharisees and the priests and the scribes became very concerned. He was taking people away from the temple and criticizing the ministry of the temple, saying it was religious when people really need a relationship with the Lord. And they despised John the Baptist. And then he was beheaded and they thought, we're free. But when he disappeared off the scene, Jesus came on the scene and began preaching and they had a bigger problem. And by the time we come to John chapter 4, we realize that the, the leaders of the temple said, we've got to do something about this guy, Jesus. He's stealing away our people from the temple. This can't be right. We've got to deal with him. And so we read in this passage here that Jesus was baptizing thousands of people of the River Jordan, just as John the Baptist had. But he realized that his time was getting short and he was going to be arrested. But he had to wait till Passover, and Passover was still a few months away. So he decided he would depart from Jerusalem and he would go to Galilee. Now, at this time in history, Israel was broken into three divisions. There was Judea in the south, then Samaria, and then Galilee. And Orthodox Jews lived in Judea and in Galilee, but not in Samaria. They despised the Samaritans. They despised the Samaritans because the Samaritans, in 721, the nation of Assyria had swept into Israel and captured this area that was called Samaria. It was made up of the 10 tribes. You know, eventually, originally there was 12 tribes. Well, there were, they split after Solomon had a son, Rehoboam. He wasn't a very good leader. There was a split in the nation of Israel. And there were two tribes that stayed in the south, Benjamin and Judah. And 10 tribes went north and uh, formed this area that, that's called Samaria. Well, the Assyrians came in in 721 BC and took them away into captivity into Assyria. <clears throat> Now, a few hundred were left, but most went away. And in 612, and almost 150 years later, the Babylonians rose up and fought the Assyrians, defeated the Assyrians, and let those people who wanted to go back to Syria, Samaria to go back to Samaria. And a few thousand did. 
But in the meantime, they had lived with the Assyrians and they'd taken on their god, Dagon. And the very interesting thing about the Sumerians, although originally they had some Jewish background, they no longer believed in the Bible. They took the first five books under Moses. They loved Moses and they believed there was a Messiah coming, but not through David. It was a Messiah just like Moses. God was going to lift up somebody to free them. Moses freed them from Egypt, but the new Messiah is going to free them from Rome. That's what the, the Samaritans believed. And they hated the Jews, and the Jews hated the Samaritans, would have nothing to do with one another. In fact, Jews would speak of the Samaritans and say they're nothing but flea-ridden street dogs. That's all they are. We don't speak to them. We don't have anything to do with them. And they're not related to us in any way. And they had intermarried, so really they were not Jews any longer. But we read in the next verse, very interestingly, that he had to pass through Samaria. This is Jesus. He's, he's going up to Galilee and we read he had to pass through Samaria. And I looked at that and I thought, why did he have to pass through Samaria? He didn't have to pass through Samaria. No Jew would go through Samaria. They would go east and cross the Jordan and go up through an area called Perea. When they got to Galilee, they'd cross back over. They would never go through Samaria because they didn't want to be even closely associated with the Samaritans. But right here, the Bible says he had to go through Samaria. Well, he had to go through Samaria for one reason, to meet the woman at the well. And, you know, we find in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus said, I don't want to do my will, but my Father's will only. That's the Christian life. Christians are people that say, look, I don't live for myself, I live for the Lord. I, I, I don't want to honor myself, I want to honor God. It's not my will that I want done, I, I, I want God's will done in my life. And so we read that Jesus had to go through Samaria to honor his heavenly Father. Well, we, we read that as he was going through Samaria, he said he came to a, a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob had given to his son, uh, gave his son Joseph. Now this is a very important area and it still is to this day. You know the great battle in, in Revelation, the Battle of Armageddon, is just a little bit north of Sychar. Sychar is a very interesting area. It's in the Shechem Valley. Shechem, as you know, when uh, Joshua came across the Jordan, he established Shechem as the capital city of Israel initially. And right by Sychar, if you stand in the city of Sychar and you look to the west, is Mount Ebal. It was on Mount Ebal that Joshua built a monument and reestablished the covenant when the children of Israel first came into the land of, of uh, Canaan. He established the covenant again for the Jewish people. He built a, a monument. Now, later, it became a, a, a place where cults Worship the idol or worship the altar that Joshua built and it became very ungodly. But to the east was another mountain called Mount Gerizim. The Samaritans believed that God had told them through Moses that you need to have a holy mountain in which to worship. So they chose Mount Gerizim. But there was a problem with Mount Gerizim because the Canaanites had been there before them and they had altars on the top of the mountain. So the Samaritans built altars on the south side of the slopes of Mount Gerizim and still do to this day. They worship there. They're Palestinians. We call them Palestinians now. But in, among the Palestinians is a group of about 10,000 Samaritans to this day who three times a year climb up the southern slope of Mount Gerizim one of them is on Passover, to worship. Very interesting area. Jesus comes to this well of Sychar. It was a well that was given, the three great patriarchs, you know, of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was given to Jacob. Jacob gave it to his son Joseph. He comes to this well. Now, this is where the drama of dramas begins. And look what we read. Verse 6, and Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, was sitting thus by the well, it was the sixth hour. Now, you know how Jews relate time. Time for Jews starts at 6 o'clock at night. That's why they had to get Jesus off the cross quickly. Because at 6 o'clock at night on that Friday, after 6 o'clock it became Saturday, which was a holy day, and you couldn't do any work. 
So they had to get Jesus off the cross about three o'clock, you know. Well, if you, if you follow the Jewish clock from six o'clock in the morning with six hours, the sixth hour would be 12 o'clock. So Jesus was there at the well at 12 o'clock midday. Now, nothing moves in Israel in those days between 11 and 3 in the afternoon. No, nothing. Nobody comes to the well. There's not going to be any cattle there, any sheep there, any goats there. No herders are going to come to the well. They're resting out of the sun from 11 till 3. But Jesus was there at the well. And something very interesting happens. Look at verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water to the well. Verse 8, for the disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The disciples, Jesus sent them off into the city to buy food. And as he's looking down the road where they had gone, he sees a figure coming along the road. She was the lady that we call the woman of the well or the woman of Sychar. Now look what happens, verse 7. Then there came a woman of Samaria to draw water and she... And Jesus said to her, excuse me, we've been walking all the way from Jerusalem. It's taken us a couple of days to get here. I wonder if you'd mind giving me a drink. Now, that's not an unreasonable request, but look at the answer that he received. And the Samaritan woman, therefore, in verse 9, said to him, excuse me, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, and I'm a Samaritan woman. And you know that Jews have absolutely no dealings with Samaritans. Uh, with, with, yeah, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. This woman looked across the well at Jesus and said, excuse me, you're asking me to give you a drink? And you don't even have a water pot. How are you going to get water out of the well? There's a rope that goes down to the well, but you, you have to have a water pot tied onto the rope to get it out. And if you think you're going to drink out of my water, well, that's never going to happen. I'm a Samaritan and a woman, and you're a Jew, and we have nothing to do with you, and there's no way in the world I'm going to give you any water. Very interesting situation. <laughs> then Jesus said this. Three words I want you to note here. The word new... The word who and the word and living water. Look at verse 10. Then Jesus answered very calmly and said to her, Dear lady, if you knew the gift of God, this word knew here is the Greek word hadice. Hey Doesn't mean anything to you, but it means this word hadice hey means to know specifically, to know without question. It's like if I asked you your name, well, you'd know it. Hadice, hey you'd know it without any question. He said to her, if you knew without question the gift of God and who it is, and who it says to you, give me a drink, why you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. Jesus is talking to this woman like he he, he talks to each one of us in different ways and is saying, look, you can settle for one of two things. You, You can have religion, but you really need a relationship with the living God. And he said, that when, if you really knew who it was that's talking to you, you wouldn't be asking for water out of this well. You, you would be asking for something far greater than that. You would be asking for living water. You know, God says that to you today. What Jesus was saying to this woman is the first thing that I want us to notice here in this passage is that knowing him is more than just knowing about him. You can travel all over the world and find... I, listen, I was an atheist uh, growing up until I was 22 years of age. And I knew about Jesus, but I certainly didn't know him. And had no interest in knowing him, really. And there are many people that can tell you all kinds of things. They can quote verses and tell you stories from the Bible. They know about him. But the question is the real question. Like he was asking this woman and he asked Nicodemus, Do you really know me? At the end of the Second World War, there were several books written about Sir Winston Churchill. Sir Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister of England, and he led uh, England during the Second World War, and quite a wonderful person. There were many, many books written about him, and they sold hundreds and some thousands, but there was one book, and they sold millions, not only in England, but all over Europe, in fact, all around the world. 
And it was a book written by his wife. <laughs> and they asked his wife, well, why is it that though other people, great journalists, and you're not a journalist, have written books about Sir Winston Churchill and few people bought them, but yours sold by the millions. Oh, and she said, oh, well, it's obvious, is it not? You see, I knew him on his good days and his bad days, his happy days, his sad days, the days when he won and days when he lost. I knew him. Other people just knew about him. Jesus is saying to this woman, look, uh, I know you know about me. But that isn't important. What I want to ask you is, do you really know me? But then Jesus goes on to say this, and, and she said to him, huh, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. You don't have a water pot. Where are you going to get this living water? Do you think you're greater than our father Joseph? Are you? Are you? Joseph is the one who gave, uh, Jacob is the one who gave us this well, and he drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. Then Jesus answered, and he said to her, lady, listen. Everyone who drinks of this water is going to thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Do you think Jesus was exaggerating when he said that? I think he was just telling a story to be nice and kind of dragging out this account? I don't think so. I think he was telling us something amazing, something matchless that each one of us here this morning need to understand. But whoever drinks of this water shall... Uh, that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Amen. Jesus is saying, look, there is an offer that I can offer you that's not just temporal. This water is just temporal. <laughs> Much that you have in this world is temporal, but I want to offer you something that's eternal. Because one day you're going to stand before my father and he's going to ask you, what did you do with your life? When I was a little boy, uh, you know, I, I was raised in New Zealand and, and we had what you call it forest, we call it the bush. And oftentimes my friend and I, Bobby Fussell, we, we, we'd go off into the bush. Now we don't have snakes or any, we don't have anything that can hurt you, so it was never a problem. We'd go off, the, one day we were in the bush and we were climbing up this mountain and uh, I saw a little creek. I looked down the creek and I, I was thinking maybe I need to get a drink. When I looked down the creek, I saw this little bubble, bubble, bubble. I, thought, I said, hey, Bobby, look, there's a well. There's a spring here. Now, I was about six or seven years old. So I got down in the water. I stuck my foot right where I saw this bubble. And then it bubbled out somewhere. So I stuck my foot. I said, Bobby, come down here. Give me, give me a couple of feet. Well, we had four feet. Didn't stop the bubble. So I said, it might think it's pretty smart, but I'm smarter. Give me a rock. Everywhere I saw a bubble and a sprinkle, I, I put a I had a monument in no time, but it didn't stop the spring. <laughs> you know, when the Holy Spirit is in your life, it's just like that. The devil will try all kinds of things to stop the spring of the Holy Spirit in your life, but he can't stop it. That's what Jesus was telling this woman. But you know, you've got to meet the master before that can happen. And so the woman, verse 15, she said to him, Well, sir, give me this water, so I will not thirst, nor come this way. She, she was being sarcastic. She said, Oh, so you've got some kind of magic water. Well, give it to me. Do you, do you think I like coming out here in the middle of the day? If you knew my background, you know how difficult it is for me and what I'm trying to hide and, and the reason that I come out here. Give me this water if you're such a great guy. And so Jesus said, verse 16, okay, <laughs> I'm willing to give you this water, but I want to ask you a question first. Why don't you go and call your husband and ask him to come here? And the woman answered and said, huh, I knew you were a fake because I have no husband. Then Jesus said to her, you know, you've told me the truth. You have no husband. For in fact, you've had five husbands and the man you're living with right now is not your husband. It, to this, you have told me the truth. It seems here when you read it in the Greek, there's a pause. This lady is kind of astonished. She realizes, I, I don't know who this fellow is. I've never seen him before. I don't know his name. 
But he's revealing things about me. And how does he know these things about me? How, how, how could he know the details of my life? Who has he spoken with? He, he's a Jew. He's never been in this territory before. How does he know these things? Well, in the next verse, she speaks up and she says to him, verse 19, Sir, I don't know you, but I perceive that you're a prophet. This word here that they're using, uh, the word prophet means you're somebody who has supernatural ability or supernatural knowledge. What she was saying is, I don't know who you are, but you're not just your average guy. There's something unusual about you. There's something unique about you. How do you know all these things about me? I've never told you and nobody else would have told you. How do you know these things? And then she does what so many people do when we try to share Jesus with them. Look at verse 20. She says, well, listen to me. Our fathers were worshipped in this mountain, pointing to Jerusalem. But your people, the Jews, say that we ought to worship in Jerusalem and Mount Zion. That's the place where we ought to worship. You know, this is an intellectual argument. If you notice, when you, you talk to people about Christ and say, my friend, I'd like to ask you a question. Have you ever met the Lord Jesus? I'll say, you're a Christian. Yeah, I just want to ask you about Jesus. Well, let me tell you, I know some preachers and they're, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. I know a lot of Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. I know people who go to church and they're just, they're, they're, I have no interest in Christianity. You know what that is? That's the intellectual argument. That's an argument that Satan will try to use to deflect where we need to be. And when people say that to me, you know what I say? You know, I know those preachers too. I even know those people you're talking about. But I know something else. You know what the church is? It's a hospital for sinners. That's why people go. Because they know they need help. But you don't think you do. I didn't want to talk to you about the church or preachers or other Christians. I want to talk to you about Jesus. So Jesus says in verse 21 here, Jesus said to a woman, Believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain, Mount Jerusalem, or in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, shall you worship the Father. Now let me be honest with you. You worship that which you, you don't know, but we worship that which we know for salvation is from the Jews. He said, look, I, I want to be honest about this. What you teach, Samaritans teach, is not biblical. But what the Jews do teach comes from the word of God and is the truth. Now this is very important. Look what he's going to say now. Verse 23. But an hour is coming and now is, right now, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, now the, people read right over this and don't even know what Jesus, well, maybe they don't notice what Jesus is saying. Listen, to have a relationship with God is a spiritual experience. You can't generate it. Music can't generate it, and I love music. Preachers can't generate it. Your parents can't generate it. The only thing that can generate it is the Holy Spirit of God. For you to have a meeting with a master will take a spiritual experience that you really cannot explain. I remember when I felt convicted of my sin. I was astonished. I thought I was a pretty good guy. I never hurt anybody. I never robbed a bank or anything like that. I, I, I was astounded. And yet, all of a sudden, I realized I was a sinner. I had this spiritual experience that even to this day, I, I can't fully explain, but I have fully experienced. I had a meeting with the Master. But not only that, Jesus said, you worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Listen, you've got to have the facts. You've got to know the truth. How are you going to worship a God when it's, a, it's just fantasy, fiction or fear. You've got to have the facts. Jesus said, I want to tell you something. To worship God, to know the master is a spiritual experience. You can't create it. But you've got to have somebody that's telling you the truth. So you better go somewhere or listen to somebody who's telling you the truth. But the hour is coming, he said, verse 23. And now is when the true worshippers, the worship of the Father and Spirit and truth, and such people the Father seeks to be his worshippers. Now look at verse 24. And God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Holy Spirit was working on this woman just so he walked on Nicodemus. 
all of a sudden, this woman was having a spiritual experience. How do I know it? Well, I know it because the next verse. The woman said to him, Sir, I don't want to argue with you any further. And I want to tell you, Sir, I know that the Messiah is coming. The one who's called Christ, this, this work is Christos, the anointed one, the one who has the answers, the one who's bringing the truth, the one who can free us from sin. She said, the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who's called the Christ. And so when he comes, I know that he's going to declare all things to us. You know what she was saying, sir? You don't know who really my background. You don't know the sorrow in my heart. Do you think I enjoy living the way I'm living? Well, I don't. But I don't have any way out. The only way out I have from the life that I'm living and the sin that has just clouded my life is I need the Messiah. And I know he's coming. When he comes, it will be him and him alone who's going to free me from the sadness of my soul. Now look what Jesus says to her next. And Jesus said to her, dear lady, I who speak to you am he. Oh, my. And at the same point, the disciples came and they marveled that he had been speaking with the woman. Yet no one said, oh, what do you seek or why do you speak with it? Now look here, verse 28. Now why had the woman come out to the well? To get water. What did she need to get water? A water pot. How many water pots did she think she had? They were rather expensive in those days. Probably one. And we read, so the woman left her water pot wasn't important anymore. And she went back into the city, ran back into the city, and she said to, notice the definite article, the man, not the guy she was living with, but she went back to the man. Who do you think the men were? Well, these were the men that used her, abused her, lied to her, she lied to them, and when they'd finished with her, they threw her to the curb like trash. But that was over. You say, preacher, how do you know? Well, I know it because the next verse. And she said to these men, come and see a man who told me all the things that I have ever done. Surely this is the Christ. Ah, but look at verse 30. And these men went out of the city and they came to Jesus. Now, why would they believe this woman? They never believed her before. They'd used her and abused her, but they never believed her before. Well, I'll tell you why. Because becoming a Christian is, means meeting the Master. It's not just knowing about him, it's knowing him. And you see, when you know him, you'll recognize the way he works. She had a spiritual experience to recognize he really is real. And you know what happens when you recognize the way he works? It'll change your life and your life will never be the same again. These men who never trusted, believed this woman before, looked at her and said, I don't know what it's about or what has happened, but something has happened to this woman. And we want to find out what it is because we want that too. You say, well, preacher, how do you know that? Well, I know that because what it says down at verse 39. And from that city, many of the Samaritans believed this is an interesting word. The word believed is pastor. That means believe without any doubt. From this city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word, not because of the word, <laughs> believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all things that I've ever done. So when these Samaritans came to him, they were asking him to stay with them and he stayed there two days and many more believed because of his word. Now look at verse 42. And they were saying to the woman, it's not because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves and hate us again. No, without any question, that this one is indeed the saviour of the world. Amen. Listen. It's not enough to know about Jesus. You've got to know him personally. You've got to meet the master. And when you know him personally, you will begin to recognize the way he works. It's not like the world works. It'll take you from a secular plane to a spiritual plane. And when you 
recognize the way he works, it will change you and your life will never be the same again. You will have a spiritual experience that will so convince you and convict you that you'll never want to go back that old lifestyle again. But there's one final thing. You won't get it from religion. These women, the, the, these men told this woman, listen, we were impressed by what you said and we came to listen to Jesus because of what you said, but we believe, not because of what you said, what's happened to you. You can't save us. The preacher can't save us. Our parents can't save us. Only meeting the master can save us. It takes a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In northern England, I'm not English, but in northern England, there's a place called Keswick. And just outside of Keswick, there's the largest lake in Great Britain. It's called Lake Windermere. Many, many years ago, this is a true story. Many years ago, there was a young boy whose father was a sailor with the old sailing ships and so on. He'd be away for months before he would come home and he would miss his dad. And he would tell his dad, you know, I love it when you're home, but I sure do miss you when you're gone. So his dad said, well, why don't you build a boat like the boat that I sail on? And you could take it out on Lake Windermere. When you feel like you're missing me, you could sail a boat and make you feel like I'm here. And the little boy said, you know, I think I'll do that. So he, he created in his mind a boat about four foot long. And with his own hands, he made it. And eventually, after several months, he took it down to Lake Windermere put it on the lake to see if it would sail. And sure enough, it did. He was so excited. And so whenever he felt that he was missing his dad and he wishes his dad was here, he would go down to Lake Windermere and put the boat in the lake and he'd see it sail around. He said, Dad, I'm thinking about you. I wish you were here, but it helps me not miss you so much when my boat is floating on the lake. Now, this lake is huge. If you've ever been there, you, you can't see the end of the lake or across the lake. It's massive. One day he took his boat down there and he had it on the lake and he said, you know what, I've got a hundred yards of string tied to that boat. I'm going to let all that string out. I'm going to have a big sail today. And he let it go right out the whole hundred yards. Of course, the string went down in the water. It got wet. It was a little harder to pull it back in. Then a wind got up and it began to blow the boat further out into the lake. And so he thought, I better get it back. He started pulling it. It was kind of hard to pull it. And he gave it a yank and the string broke. The boat began to float away. He jumped off the pier and he ran down the seashore and he was watching it and watching it and eventually it disappeared over the horizon. And he came home and he was broken hearted. He told his mom, you know that boat that I created and made with my own hands? I lost it. And his mother said, well look, we'll save up some money and you can build another. I don't want another boat. I wanted that boat because that boat was the one that reminded me of my dad, and that's the boat I want. She said, well, you've lost it. Well, he was coming home from school a couple of weeks after he'd lost the boat, and he walked by a, a store, and there, right in the window of the store, was his boat. <laughs> Could not believe it. He ran into the store, and he said, hey, that's my boat that's in the window of your store. And the man said, no, that's not your boat. That, that's my boat. He said, no, no, that's my boat. I created that boat. I built it with my own hands and I lost it down on Lake Windermere. The man said, no, 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 it's my boat. He said, no, it's not. It's mine. I want it back. He said, no, no, you can't because a man brought it in here. He said it was his. And I bought it from him and now it's mine. And son, if you want that boat, you're going to have to buy it. He said, no, I can put it on lay-by, but you're going to have to buy it. I'm not giving it to you. He said, well, how much do you want for the boat? He said, 20 shillings. 20 shillings? I only get one shilling pocket money a week. 20 weeks. He said, you want the boat? You're going to have to buy it. So he started putting aside every week he'd come and give the shop owner a shilling, a shilling. And eventually got to 18, 19, 20. Oh, man. He's going to get his boat back. He went on that day and he put the shilling down. He said, sir, that's my life. 20 shillings. I want my boat. The man said, I've got it for you. It's out the back. And he went out the back and he got the boat and he brought it to the boy and he gave it to him and he, he took it in his arms and he, he backed up against the wall in the store and he said, 
It's my boat. I created this boat. I made it with my own hands and I lost it. Now I've bought it back and it's twice mine. It's twice mine. Listen, my friends. Jesus created you in your mother's womb and he lost you to sin. And on the cross, he bought you back. You're not once his, you're twice his. But to be his, you've got to know the master. Not just know about him, you, you've got to really know him. And when you know him, you will recognize the way he works. And when you recognize the way he works, it will change your life and your life will never, ever be the same again. But nobody else can do it for you but you. And I believe there is maybe one or others here this morning that God is speaking to and said, my friend, I know you know about me, but you don't really know me. And I want you today to have a spiritual experience like you've never had before and you need to personally confess your sin and meet the Master. Is God speaking to you today? God challenging you today? I think for all of us it's time to stop playing games at the foot of the cross and really get real with the one who can change our life in such a way it'll never be the same again. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for who you are and for the difference that you alone make in living. And Father, there's nothing we can do to pay you back for all that you've done for us because you created us and fashioned us in our mother's womb. And you made us with your own hands for yourself. But sin entered the scene and stole away our, our soul from you. But just as you promised, you claim. And you died on the cross to buy us back. And so, Father, we're twice yours. Twice yours. But we can never be yours permanently unless we've met the Master. Dear Lord, I pray that you would speak to us. I know that uh, there are many here today that do know you and serve you faithfully, have done, will do, until you come again or until you call them home. But I believe there are others here that could be just playing games at the foot of the cross. If that's so, Lord, I pray today they'd make that decision to meet the Master. Maybe there are others here that never been baptized, never taken that step of public declaration of their faith. They need to do that. Maybe they have never joined this church. This is a great church. Just about to receive a new pastor. What a wonderful thing it would be to, to come today or next Sunday and join this church. Maybe there are others who need to make a recommitment to you. I don't know. I, I don't know, Lord. I just believe that, that you're on the throne and you're speaking to us today. Lord, I pray that you would challenge us and that you would have us to do that alone that honors you, not to impress anybody sitting around us, leaders of the church, but Father, only to honor you and to please you. Speak to us and challenge us to do that alone that will please you today. And we ask this in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake alone. Amen.